Hey there, it's Isaac Shade, host of Locked on Tar Heels. Thanks so much for checking out this bonus Final Four crossover podcast episode with myself and Locked on Blue Devils host, JJ Jackson. We thought it would be great to get you a little extra content this weekend heading in to the Final Four to give you a, a viewpoint, a point of view from the North Carolina side of things and the same thing from the Duke side of things. Now, never fear, I still have the normal Friday show out. You can listen to it now. I've got a, a personal Roy Williams story on the one year anniversary of his retirement, my usual Four Corners game preview, and then my final four predictions that will come absolutely 100% true this Saturday and Monday. Would love for you to check that out as well. Well, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna roll the Locked on Tar Heels intro that you're used to seeing, and right after that, as soon as that's done, you will see JJ and myself bringing you this bonus episode. I hope you enjoy it. You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, Isaac Shade from Locked on Tar Heels here. It is good to be with you. What's up? We got JJ Jackson from Locked on Duke. Isaac, I'm so excited to chat with you again. Here we are, the final four tomorrow, Duke and North Carolina. I'm thinking about our journeys with the Locked On Podcast Network together. And just prior to the first meeting, sort of a welcome to the family for you as we set that up. And so I'm so thrilled to get to do this again with you. Dude, right on. Absolutely. And I remember uh, that was an absolute throttling. The Blue Devils <laughs> just ran the Tar Heels out of their own gym that day. And uh, I was like, man, I, I don't know if uh, if this is going to happen. But then, as we know, Carolina came back and won the second game at Cameron, unfortunately for the Blue Devils, ruining Coach K's first retirement party there. And uh, the Tar Heels are wanting to ruin another retirement party. The Blue Devils are wanting to send Coach K out on a high note. So it's going to be fun to get to talk about it. Well, I'm well aware of the hashtags that you've been starting <laughs> on, on Locked on Tar Heels, Isaac. I am an avid listener to know what the opposition is talking about. And I also like to think that going into the initial retirement party, if I'm just, you know, I try to find Danny, I'm superstitious in a lot of this as a fan of sports, which I think a lot of people can relate to. And as I'm looking at the differences in the first meeting in Chapel Hill versus the second in Cameron Indoor Stadium, you and I had schedule conflicts going into that last week and we weren't able to talk. So the fact that we talked before the first meeting we didn't talk before the seconds. It's a little, little bit better now. That's for right. That reason I, alone, going into the final four, I should I should have come up with some schedule conflicts so that we weren't <laughs> having this conversation. I am sorry, Hubert Davis, for how I have just jinxed your team's ability oh, to win on Saturday. <laughs> this is great. So legitimately. JJ, like, this is crazy. What, like, beyond, let's just look at the bigger picture for a minute, beyond just Duke and Carolina. What does it mean for college basketball that these two teams are meeting in the Final Four for the first time that they've ever played in the NCAA tournament? I think it means everything. This is the greatest rivalry in the sport. You've never had this happen before, as you mentioned. And now both teams have a chance to end their opponent's season. You just do not see that. Uh, the closest you would really see to that in college football, in that final week of the year, mm. when everybody is trying to go to conference championship games or trying to punch the, their tickets into the college football playoff, we really don't see that in college basketball with these great of rivalries ending seasons in the NCAA tournament. And so that's going to happen tomorrow. Someone's season will end thanks to the hands of their worst uh, nightmare. Yes, absolutely. And not to mention these two, but on the other side of the bracket, we've got Kansas and Villanova, <laughs> two of the other biggest brands in the sport. Uh, these four teams combined to have won four of the last six national championships, seven of the last 13. TV execs have to be just salivating at this setup. What do you think? Yeah, I think the viewership numbers are going to be great. I think they're very pleased that we've got these teams uh, in the mix and have an opportunity to compete for that national championship, the fact that these are winning programs, the fact that they've been playing well, and the fact that they've got these sort of premier coaches at the head of their programs means everything. And so I think there will be a lot of eyeballs on the games this weekend, and I'm going to be watching every second of it, I can tell you that much. 
Absolutely. I will too. I'm actually, I don't know if I've told you, I am going to be in the building for these games. Amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> so, so really looking forward to it. Uh, yeah, so that'll be great. Um, the bu- One of the bummers for the TV eyeballs is this is one of those years where it's on TBS instead of CBS. And obviously across the country, uh, there's much less um, viewership of TBS than CBS. I can't imagine if this was on CBS, just how big that number would be. Yeah, oh. hindsight's always twenty twenty. So that's <laughs> obviously a, a missed call on uh, on the execs that be to put this on, on TBS as opposed yeah. to your basic uh, channels there with CBS. My goodness. So, JJ, it feels to me like over the past couple years, maybe college basketball has has lost a step or two on the national scene. What do you think this Final Four with these Blue Bloods can maybe do to help uh, kickstart, restart some of that national love for what I think is the best sport in our country? A lot of people don't want to hear this, but it really does go back to the big brands. When your big brands in a sport are playing well, you're going to have more eyes on the action that's taking place because you've got the larger fan bases that are wanting supporting them. And equally to that degree, you've got teams that want to see those schools go down. So the fact that we've got four incredible brands that are going to be competing in the final four, establishing their programs for years to come in a lot of instances. And by the way, a lot of these teams are going to have players going to play at the next level at the NBA and reloading in the recruiting class Uh, and that sort of thing. I think it sets up, and I I do think that we'll sort of see a shift again in the viewership of college basketball if we can continuously see events like this. That's right, absolutely. And I think NIL coming in is going to play a huge factor in keeping more of our stars in college before making the leap. Like I legitimately wouldn't be surprised if Drew Timmy stayed at Gonzaga for another year. He's not going to he's not going to get drafted with a guaranteed contract. He's going to make more money at Gonzaga than he would as a professional next year. I think that's good for the sport as well. Yeah, no, I think the idea of having these big players coming back for another year elevates college basketball as a whole. Obviously, we talk about the kind of decline, and it does go hand-in-hand with the one-and-done era that we've seen in basketball. And so uh, the fact that you now have the name image likeness in place so that athletes can earn a little bit of money in addition to maintaining their collegiate eligibility, it's going to want to keep them around campus much longer. We've already seen that as this is sort of the end of the first academic year of NIL. We've already seen that in football, right? And football carries the conversation always in America. That's how this works. And so the idea that we're seeing these college football stars stick around and want to live out college careers longer, I do think we'll see that on the basketball front as well. And Drew Timmy is the perfect example of that. Yeah, absolutely. Now, we're talking about all these huge brands, and it's funny how the NCAA tournament always seems to play out that way. We have all these great upsets, but then the Final Four filters down to the biggest names in the sport, typically. But we did have uh, what, by the numbers, is the greatest Cinderella run in the history of the modern NCAA tournament dating back to 1985 when things expanded to 64 teams, and that is the St. Peter's Peacocks. How about that special run, JJ? Yeah, I'm excited to, to share my thoughts and then your, hear yours as well. That's the beauty of these Locked On crossovers. My Duke audience gets to hear a little bit of your perspective and, and vice versa and that sort of thing. So uh, from the outside looking in, initially when you see that matchup with Kentucky, on the edge of my seat the entire time, is this actually going to happen? Oh, my goodness, it happened. <laughs> St. Peter's pulls off this incredible upset the numbers that you start to hear about coaches' salaries in the mix compared to the spending and the budget of Kentucky basketball. Only a handful of coaches are even full-time salaried positions at St. Peter's outside of their head coach, Shaheen Holloway. The school sizes compared to how big the University of Kentucky is. I mean, it was the greatest upset in every metric you sort of look at in the sport. And then they kept winning. Then they took down another school from the state of Kentucky and Murray State that a lot of people really enjoyed watching. Murray State won 21 straight games at one point this season, which is really difficult to do, and uh, found a way to once again beat a Purdue team that has some bigs on the inside. They've got Jaden Ivey, the talented guard, on the outside. And then from the Duke perspective, you're really sitting there thinking, because Duke having won in the Sweet 16 the day before and North Carolina being the Friday-Sunday regional final weekend, 
um, schedule, it's like, oh, my gosh, North Carolina, if they knock off UCLA, they have a chance of playing St. Peter's <laughs> for a chance to go to the Final Four and match up with Duke. I mean, I couldn't believe it that it all came together. Was so excited that the upset of Kentucky took place. Continue to uh, be excited that St. Peter's was winning. But then all of a sudden you're like, wow, we've got a uh, 15 seed competing for a chance to go to the Final Four. It's just something special that I, I don't know when we'll – I mean, it legitimately could be decades before we see that again. Although with parity going the way it is, you know, now we've had a 15 seed in the Sweet 16 for two straight years uh, with Oral Roberts doing it last year. I really thought, I mean, obviously I didn't think they would have beaten Kentucky. Uh, Murray State was a little bit less of a shock to me, but I just thought the Purdue game would be a joke because Purdue with all that size inside that you talked about with with Travion Williams, with Zach Eady, and St. Peter's is a rather undersized team, and I just thought it was going to be <laughs> like David and Goliath, yeah. literally, you know? And and as you mentioned with, with Ivy, just running the show, people, have, I've begun to see him move into that top tier of NBA draft boards along with Paolo Bancaro, along with Chet Holmgren, and uh, along with Jabari Smith from Auburn. Uh, I begin to hear his name there. And so you, you combine all of that and it's like, well, yeah, Purdue's going to take care of it. It'll be Carolina and Purdue or UCLA and Purdue. But that was just not meant to be crazy 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 now we move on and we've got carolina and duke in the final four we're going to talk all about that dive into the game in just a second but first jj is going to tell you about built bar you're exactly right isaac i'm excited to do that today's edition of locked on blue devils and locked on tar heels we call it a locked on crossover is brought to you by our friends over at built bar this is by far the best tasting protein bar that you were going to find on the market. I start my day every day with a built bar. And I know so many of my colleagues at the locked on podcast network do the same. All of these built bars are covered in 100% real chocolate. I promise you a hundred percent real chocolate, low calorie, high in protein. You can replace your candy bars with these as they're so much better. A typical candy bar can be anywhere from two to 300 calories. Go to built.com and scroll down to the macros chart. You'll be blown away by what you see. High in protein, low in calorie, high fiber, low carbs. What you can do, go to built.com, use promo code LOCKED15, L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5 is that promo code, and get 15% off your order. Again, built.com, promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off. Built Bar is a proud sponsor of the Locked On Podcast Network. Moving forward here today, this Locked On crossover, hanging out with Isaac Shade from Locked On Tar Heels. My name is JJ Jackson, here with Locked On Blue Devils. The greatest rivalry in college basketball is getting set for a matchup in the Final Four. The winner of the contest gets an opportunity to compete for a national title. Hubert Davis is in his first season as the head coach of the Tar Heels. Mike Krzyzewski is in his last season as the head coach for Duke. After four-plus decades... Hubert goes to his first Final Four. Mike Krzyzewski goes to his 13th. Isaac, will you look at the coaching matchup in this one? You couldn't have a more opposite matchup. It's, it just is is so crazy. Like to like we look back a year ago from now. We don't. Roy Williams is still the coach of North Carolina this time last year. Actually, we're like right on the on the precipice of of the change of his retirement. And who would have thunk it that that we would be here the first time ever? Of course, the first time ever that they meet in the NCAA tournament. It's the Final Four. It's Coach K's last year. It's Coach Davis's first year. And I just love that dichotomy. Here's here's whose head I'd love to be in is John Shire's head. Like, what what is he thinking about right now? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm really curious as well. He's going to take over the chair of Mike Shashevsky, and you talk about pressure. Well, your first season. The year prior, your school went to the Final Four. So you've got a program in a good position. He's already got the number one recruiting class signed, still delivered, coming to Durham. A couple of his players were standouts in the McDonald's All-American game earlier this week. But, no, I would love to know what he's thinking about right now. Yeah, it's got to be a crazy thing. Well, he won't be playing in this game as he did in the 2010 National Championship game, but some other Duke Blue Devils will. And so, JJ, I'd love to hear from you a couple keys to this game for the Blue Devils. Yeah, let's go back and forth here, Isaac. I'll give a key, you counter what Deal. you want, and we'll kind of go Deal. back and forth here. So, 
uh, I love for, it. for this Duke basketball team, taking care of the basketball, plain and simple, is the first one that I'm going to highlight here. And you might be looking at me and we're listening to this podcast a little confused by what I'm saying because if you listen to national media right now, all they're talking about is how talented this Duke basketball team has been this season. And, oh, all of a sudden, they're finally putting all the pieces together and they're playing their best basketball at the right time of the season. But what if I told you that in all four NCAA tournament games already this season, Duke turned the basketball over more times than their opponent did? Because they did, and they still found a way to win the basketball game. But in a game like this against an opponent like North Carolina with a team that absolutely loves to run in transition when you're talking about Caleb Love and R.J. Davis, taking care of the basketball is going to be crucial for Duke in this matchup with North Carolina. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and Carolina, for their part, um, has been holding on to the ball really well. In the uh, second round game against Baylor, that, that Baylor pressure defense, as they had that crazy comeback, yeah. forced Carolina into 21 turnovers for that game. But then in the Sweet 16 and Elite 8, Carolina had just eight turnovers in each of those games. And so that storyline will be a very interesting one for us to watch on uh, tomorrow, on Saturday. For the Tar Heels, one of the big issues, one of the differences between the first two games is in the game in Chapel Hill, Armando Baycott started off guarding Paolo Bancaro. That is not a good recipe for success for the Tar Heels. Very quickly was saddled with two fouls, found himself on the bench, and the Blue Devils were off and running. In the second matchup, Coach Davis switched things up, allowed Baycott to stay on Mark Williams, and that put Brady Manick on Ban Carroll. Now, Manick is not a great defender by any means. However, he is more fleet-footed than uh, Armando Baycott is, and that allowed Leaky Black, Carolina's best defender, who can guard one through four, essentially, to be on A.J. Griffin. Now, he would switch to Bancaro as well when uh, Baycott would go to the bench and the Tar Heels would play small with, with Manic at the five. So one of the keys I'm looking for is how do the Tar Heels decide to match up in this game? Because another key to that was in the first game, we, we had um, Trevor Keels not quite back from injury fully yet, and so uh, there was a lot more of Mr. Roach in the game, and that allowed um, him as a, as a shorter guard for R.J. Davis to be on him fully. And so that's going to be an interesting dynamic as well, is how does Carolina match up? I'm going to imagine they go with that same thing that they did in the, in the game at Duke, is that Baycott will be on Mark Williams, Leaky Black will be on AJ Griffin. You'll see Brady Manick on Bancaro. And we'll just have to then see who, like, how does that play out? Where where do the advantages come from on each end of the court? Yeah, the Jeremy Roach that we saw in the first meeting and really in the second meeting is not the same Jeremy Roach that we've seen in this NCAA tournament. And so getting to see him have another opportunity to play against North Carolina, the same could be said for RJ Davis with how much he's improved this season yes. as a sophomore. If I'm buying stock in juniors going into the <laughs> 2022 and 2023 season, I want those guys right at the top for yes. how much yes. they're going to run their respective programs. All right, so so let's keep going. Another key for this Duke basketball team is going to be the glass. This Duke basketball mm. team uh, needs to pride itself on rebounding the basketball. I've talked about this throughout the week on Locked On Blue Devils. If you have watched – at least two games. I'll give you two games. At least two Duke North Carolina games over the last decade, two decades, whatever you want to call it. What is just known <laughs> is that regardless of the talent of a North Carolina team, they are going to rebound the basketball. North Carolina can have seasons where they are bound for the NIT. We saw it in the years prior to uh, when, when Duke won in 2010. And North Carolina is still one of the best rebounding teams in all of the country. The first meeting between Duke and North Carolina this season, Duke had 40 rebounds to just 24 for North Carolina. There was a plus 16 advantage in that category, whereas in the meeting in Cameron Indoor Stadium, North Carolina won the rebounding battle 37-34. And the reason that's so important is because in March Madness, in these NCAA tournament games, when you're fighting for every single possession, the greatest stop on defense is that defensive rebound. 
because you're immediately taking away a possession from the other team after a missed shot, not giving second chances. And knowing how Baycott performs so well on the glass and knowing that other gu- the guards can really rebound well for the North Carolina team, keep it themselves and push it in transition. Rebounding the basketball, stopping offensive chances, second chances, and then breakaways for North Carolina going to be critical for the Stoop team. Absolutely, JJ. And you're spot on. That first game in North at in Chapel Hill was one of just three times all season the Tar Heels have been out-rebounded. And that was a big factor in yeah. Duke being able to not just win that game, but win it handily. And and so uh, Carolina is absolutely looking to do that. Armando Baycott now is the single season North Carolina rebounding leader in, in, in the entire history of the Carolina program. He has more rebounds this season than any other Tar Heel ever. We're talking Tyler Hansborough, Sam Perkins, Bryce Johnson, everybody. Armando Baycott is at the top of that heap. So absolutely, if Duke can keep the Tar Heels off the glass, get that offensive or that defense of rebound one shot for the Tar Heels that would be huge for Duke as they try to win this game I'm not at all surprised to hear that about Baycott he's been so good this season and uh yeah and North Carolina's had so many great players coming through that program so to be at the top of that kudos kudos yes absolutely my second key for this game is going to be watching Caleb Love Caleb Love is just as he goes, the Tar Heels seem to go or not. For example, in his two-year career in Carolina so far, so far they are undefeated when he scores 20 or more points. His freshman year, he had two really big games against the Blue Devils, both at home and in Cameron. This year, though, was a little up and down in the games versus the Blue Devils. One of the things that Caleb Love tends to do is take too much on his shoulders and think he has to bear too much of the weight. The other thing is that the Tar Heels are undefeated this season when he has five or more assists. So something that Coach Davis has been continually preaching to him is, Caleb, get your teammates involved in this game, especially when your shots aren't falling. Now, if Love is hot from the beginning of the game, that doesn't necessarily always mean something. He hit a three to start the game against UCLA when he dropped 30 and then didn't score again the rest of the entire half. He scored that hit that three less than a minute in and then didn't score again the rest in the half, but poured in 27 in the second half to uh, finish with 30 points. So Caleb Love needs to play within himself. If the shot's falling, by all means, take it. He's being a lot more aggressive lately, getting to the rim. But if it's not falling, he's got an offensive juggernaut around him in everyone other than Leaky Black, who is uh, similarly to him, more, you know, uh, who is more of a distributor, who's doing the small things, playing defense. But in Brady Manick, in RJ Davis, in Armando Baycott, if your shots aren't falling, Caleb Love, get those dudes the ball. <laughs> So, JJ, one last thing we want to look at at the matchup, and then we'll go to our predictions. What's your X factor for Duke in this game? Let's have you start. You gave a lot of love to to Caleb Love there, so let's have you start, and then I'll give you the Duke X factor. Very good. Funny thing is, last time we uh, chatted, or excuse me, before the game in Cameron, I said that Puff Johnson was my X factor for Carolina. And then what happened? The Tar Heels never subbed in the second half. (laughs) Boy, Egg on my face for that one. What a terrible call that was. My X Factor is Brady Manick. This dude is on fire right now. Who knew that this this guy coming out of Oklahoma who had never been there could come and be this dominant force for Carolina? What he needs to be, he's been consistent. And so to that regard, you wouldn't think of him as an X Factor. But... The reason he's an X-Factor is that he's got to get going early. The Tar Heels need to get him involved in the game from the get-go. He's got this insanely quick trigger, but he's got a more athletic Paolo Bancaro on him. Can he score in and around Bancaro? That's what I'm watching for, for the Tar Heels X-Factor. An X-Factor for the Duke Blue Devils as they get set to take on North Carolina in the Final Four. It might be easy to say A.J. Griffin, who scored a game-high 27 points in the meeting in Chapel Hill, uh, it's certainly easy to highlight someone like Paulo Bancaro will, who will get his in this basketball game. Mark Williams going to do the same on the offensive end. But I'm going to go with Trevor Keels, who's mm. become the sixth man for this Duke basketball team in the NCAA tournament, lost his starting spot back to Jeremy Roach, an old high school teammate of his. Trevor Keels coming off the bench for Duke, a team that will only play seven guys maybe, and that seventh man being Theo John, for just a couple of sparing minutes 
off the bench on the interior. When Trevor Keels plays well, Duke plays well. In fact, this season, when Trevor Keels scores at least 13 points, Duke has yet to lose a basketball game this season. He's going to give it to you on the defensive end. We saw it in the first game of the season against Kentucky. All eyeballs were on this top 10 showdown between Duke and Kentucky. The first game to start Coach K's final season. And this freshman named Trevor Keels came onto the stage, had 25 points, and he stole the headlines over Paulo Bancaro, who was the number one player in the class. So the idea that Trevor Keels plays well in one of the final games, or possibly the final game for Coach K after starting the season playing so well, that's why I want to highlight him as an X factor in the matchup. I'm so ready for the game, Isaac. I know people are probably getting tired of, of hearing all the previews and that sort of thing. And with that being said, everyone's favorite part has got to be predictions. So we got to start to make some predictions and give you the final reasons why and how Duke or North Carolina is going to win in the Final Four. And we'll do that in just a moment. Let me tell you about Bet Online. After months of playing, college basketball has finally determined the top teams for its Final Four, and we've been talking about it here today on our crossover. And that is going to determine this year's national championship this coming weekend. When you look at it, these four teams, Duke has the best odds at 3-2, to two, Kansas at 2-1 to one odds, Villanova at 22-5, to five, and the Tar Heels with the least odds, the worst chance of the four, 19-4 odds to bring this championship home. So when we think about Bet Online, they are your number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. From all the latest odds, contests, and player props, you name it. Bet Online remains the best spot for all your latest sports developments, including podcasts and reviews for all the leagues this season. And remember, it's not just basketball. Bet Online is your continued source for all your wagering information needs, including live betting and your favorite Vegas casino games. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet Online, where the game starts. Well, as JJ just said a moment ago, we got to give you some predictions. That's why you're here. You want to know what we think, how this game is going to turn out. And so uh, let's look first at what it takes for Duke to win this game. JJ, finish this sentence for me. Duke wins if... Yeah, I, I think Duke wins this basketball game on Saturday if Duke can knock down from the three-point line. If they can knock down shots very well in a large volume of three-point shots. I really like Duke's chances in a Elite Eight matchup against Arkansas. What if I told you the Blue Devils won that game by knocking down less than five three-pointers from the outside? Because they did. They only had four, and they won that basketball game. And one of their toughest tests yet, being down by five, with five minutes to play against Michigan State in the round of 32, Duke would wind up winning the basketball game thanks to a three-pointer from Jeremy Roach, Duke finished just 5 of 13 shooting from three-point range in that win. This Duke basketball team is not shooting a lot of threes in the NCAA tournament, not necessarily because they're not making threes, but because they're scoring so easily from two-point range with the drives from Jeremy Roach, with the drives from Paula Bancaro and the dunks on the inside for Mark Williams, that the Duke basketball team has found themselves in a position to not have to shoot three balls. And so when you look at the series so far this season, this Duke basketball team went 9 of 19 from three-point range in the first meeting where they won by 20 points over North Carolina. And outside of Brady Manick, the Tar Heels were lousy in that three-point department. North Carolina went 3 of 12 and non-Brady Manick three-pointers in that first meeting. So if Duke can clearly dominate the three-point line, a spot where they haven't performed well and can still win, by the way. Duke can still win this basketball game because of their elite offense by having a poor first shooting performance. If they get that, Duke's going to be in good control. Yeah, absolutely. For me, I see Duke winning this game if they are able to do all the, like, just let that elite offense run wild. Carolina's defense has vastly improved in recent weeks, but it would take a lot for Carolina to repeat what happened in Cameron in this neutral site environment. One of the things that I'm looking at is Mark Williams being that eraser at the rim. 
Uh, Armando Baycott is, a, is more of a below the rim kind of player. And so if Mark Williams is able to assert himself, uh, maybe even on the offensive side, get Baycott into foul trouble, get him to the bench. Uh, Carolina is playing even fewer players than the seven you talked about for Duke. We might see a little Puff Johnson. We might see a little Dontre Styles, but it's this iron five as people have taken to calling them. And so I think if Duke's aggressiveness is able to get the Tar Heels in foul trouble, if Mark Williams is a racing shot, at the rim and allowing Griffin and Bancaro to just do what they do, Duke wins this basketball game. I think that's so accurate with what we've seen from this Duke team so far this season. And it's the offense that grabs the eyeballs for this Duke team. At times, you've seen this Duke team with five players on their roster projected to be first round picks in this year's NBA draft. That has only happened once before, five or six years ago, the Kentucky Wildcats were able to put five players in the first round. While a couple of the guys like Wendell Moore Jr. being one of them that's fallen a little bit down in the draft boards, everyone knows your stock has the highest potential of climbing the greatest proportions when it comes to Final Four weekend and a possible run to the national championship. Absolutely. And we haven't even talked about Wendell Moore. Like, how have we not discussed him yet on this podcast? One of the uh, one of the junior captains for this Duke team, they go as he goes. So let's talk about North Carolina. Isaac, you go first here. North Carolina wins in the final four over Duke if what happens? Well, when we look back, JJ, Carolina lost to Pittsburgh at home several weeks ago. Yikes, ouch, quad four loss. Since that moment, though, they are 10-1 and one with their lone loss being the same team that, uh, that Duke lost to in the ACC tournament was that desperate Virginia Tech team. Other than that, Carolina has won every other game they've played since then. If you go to Bart Torvik, where you can look at um, how a team is performing over a certain period of time, since that Pittsburgh game, Carolina is performing as the fifth best defense in the nation, according to Bart Torvik, the best of these four teams. Meanwhile, the Blue Devils defense in that same stretch is 171st in the nation. Carolina, to me, wins this game if they're able to exploit uh, Duke on the on Duke's defensive end of the court, as they did at Cameron. Carolina has been using a lot of pick and roll now in this Hubert Davis offense, kind of a switch from how they would play offensively under Roy Williams. And so Carolina is probably going to be looking to get Mark Williams into a lot of pick and roll action um, and use that either to get the guards an open look or a mismatch or to get Armando Baycott rolling to the rim or a kick out to Manic on the wing. To me, Carolina wins if they're able to exploit that Duke defense. I agree. I think the Stuke team has had problems defensively, and that's kind of where I was going to go with my key for North Carolina to win this basketball game. You mentioned the first or the second meeting, hashtag ruin a retirement party, <laughs> and I really don't want the hashtag another retirement party ruined to be trending <laughs> tomorrow night. But when you look at the defense – 94 points scored against Duke in Cameron Indoor Stadium. That's the most points Duke gave up all season long against a North Carolina team that they had defeated by 20 points earlier in the season. And as you mentioned, had kind of been humbled down the stretch of the season with the Pittsburgh game and, and a couple of other uh, not as great performances from North <laughs> Carolina. So if this Duke team does not play well defensively, North Carolina is going to be in a good spot. And I do think three-point defense – has been one of those issues for Duke. The Duke team in the round of 32, really, if you're looking at matchups, fared better against Michigan State than they would have against the 10 seed Davidson, considering how great of a three-point shooting team Davidson was. How did Michigan State respond? Well, they went 11 of 22 from the three-point line, 50%. They were 7 for 10, 70% shooting from three in the first half of that game. And we've seen the likes of Brady Manick Caleb Love last year, R.J. Davis certainly knocking down shots from the outside. So if Duke's defense can't figure out what to do, play man versus the zone, we've seen a couple of times here in the NCAA tournament. If That's there right. are defensive lapses, North Carolina's got to feel good. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's where Carolina is really thriving this year. Brady Manick right now has the sixth 
most threes in a single season in Carolina history with 92, just behind oh. some of the top shooting names that you've ever heard of. And Caleb Love is just right behind him. And so you're spot on with that. Carolina is reigning from threes just as their head coach would have been doing himself. Quickly, JJ, let's just give our predictions for both these final four matchups, most outstanding player and the national championship game. Let's start with the early game. Kansas Villanova, the Jayhawks are favored by four. Yeah, really uh, excited to see this game play out. Unfortunately, we will not see Justin Moore take the floor for Villanova, which I know has been a talking point in college basketball uh, so far this week leading up to that matchup after suffering a torn Achilles. Uh, you hate to see that, especially at this part of the season, considering how well Villanova has been playing. While you have to have elite guard play in March and in this tournament to win it all, and Villanova has gotten that out of one of their very veteran leaders, Colin Gillespie, I think Kansas is too much for this team. I think the interior presence that they've got, an experienced point guard, and Remy Martin, who came over from Arizona State, and then Ochai Abaji, he's got some good odds to possibly be the most outstanding player of this tournament, kind of disappeared in some bigger games for Kansas this season. I don't think he does in the Final Four. I think it's a rock chalk Jayhawk Saturday night. Absolutely. I'm right there with you. What a, what a bummer for Justin Moore. The last minute of that Elite Eight matchup, uh, it just your heart goes out to him because this sport, I mean, college and all sports are about the stories and, and the young men and women that play it. And so best wishes, Justin Moore, from, from JJ and I to you. But yes, if Colin Gillespie can play out of his mind, Villanova has a chance here, but I just don't see it happening. I tweeted earlier in the week. I know we're both looking at the Tar Heels or Blue Devils winning this thing. I wouldn't be surprised if we looked up on Monday night and the Jayhawks are standing up there during one shining moment and Remy Martin's the MOP. Like that's a very real crazy possibility that we wouldn't have thought of even a couple weeks ago as he had been floundering for a lot of the year. But yes, I have the Jayhawks to win this a game. I think Agbaji has a big game as he did against Miami last weekend. Let's move so, forward. Then. The yeah, big one. go ahead. The big one. It's Duke in North Carolina. When this game tips off, both teams will know who's waiting for them on Monday night when the national championship game is set to be played. So as we take a look at the national champ, or excuse me, the final four game between Duke and North Carolina, college basketball's finest rivalry, Coach K going up against the Tar Heels for the 100th time since taking over as head coach of the Duke Blue Devils, a win. He finishes 51 and 49 <laughs> against the folks eight miles away in Chapel Hill a loss, and Mike Krzyzewski walks away, his career being ended by North Carolina, and he finishes with an even 500 record, 50 and 50 against the Tar Heels. Isaac, I think this has storybook ending type feelings and a feel for Mike Krzyzewski, the way this basketball team has been playing as of late. I think the fact that 100 players were there watching the game in Cameron Indoor and Coach K's final game inside that venue added a level of pressure that these players surprisingly will not feel in the Final Four. And the fact that after that game was over, after we saw North Carolina put 94 points on the board against Duke in the regular season, and there are clips out there of the team sprinting down the stairwell back behind Cameron Indoor Stadium to go celebrate in their locker room, the team coming back out, the Duke Blue Devils, and having to watch their coach address the crowd afterwards – I think there's just way too much motivation. I think the talent is just way too much for this Duke basketball team. I do think Duke knocks off North Carolina and earns their spot in the national championship game. There you go. The Blue Devils are favored by four in this one, according to Bet Online, one of our great sponsors. As you would imagine, JJ, I've got to go the other way. I think the Tar Heels are bringing this out. Coach Hubert Davis moving on to the national championship in his first season. Unfortunately for Coach K, ending his marvelous career that he's had at the helm in Durham. For me, it's going to be something of a, of a replication of what happened in Durham. A very close game that the Tar Heels pulled away down the stretch. I think this is going to be... I, I would... I really hope this is just for my heart's sake, I hope not, but for the good of college basketball, would just love to see a very tight game back and forth, tight in terms of the score while the players are playing loose. Just want to see amazing basketball players making great plays. And then here's my big, bold prediction. 
Brady Manic three-pointer at the buzzer for a North Carolina walk-off victory. Both teams play great. Tar Heels win on a Brady Manic three-pointer at the buzzer. Why not have that kind of ending? You know, you ask Isaac, and, and or certainly I was asked going into the final meeting in Cameron Indoor Stadium and walking into that basketball game, I think everyone, both sides of the LARP rivalry, all Tar Heel fans listening to us right now, all Blue Devil fans listening to thought this is it there's no way these teams will play again and yet here we are in that instance and so going into that final game the biggest question the most frequent question I think the Duke community was asked if you know you're going to lose this game would you rather be blown out or Mm -hmm. lose on a last second shot to North Carolina and I think for me it would be the blowout fashion as a, having a little bit more time to comprehend and handle it than the pure sadness and heartbreak and emotion that's similar to what North Carolina experienced in the title game against Villanova. So, my friend, if your prediction comes true, just know, as happy as Brady Manick will be with his teammates celebrating a trip <laughs> to the national championship game, I am going to have an absolutely devastated heart, much as the rest of the Duke community will, watching Coach yes. K walk off that floor for the final time. Absolutely. And and either way, one of these fan bases, one of these coaching staffs, one of these groups of players is going to walk off the court absolutely wrecked while the other team is absolutely jubilant. Like it's just, I, I just I cannot begin to comprehend what that environment is going to be like tomorrow night in the Caesars Superdome. Yes. <laughs> Can't wait. It's going to be a lot of fun. So there you have it. We're looking at, we both have different predictions for who's going to win this game, as you would guess, coming (laughs) into it. Uh, Man, it's going to be so exciting. The atmosphere will be electric. JJ, I can't wait to talk to you about it afterwards and and just let you know how the vibe in the building was. I know both fan bases are going to be excited. And keep in mind, there's going to be Kansas and Villanova people in the place too. Should be a great time for the sport of college basketball. You will certainly be hearing from me in some form or fashion this weekend, Isaac. And uh, I'm so excited to hear about the environment there. And I'm more so excited to have to listen to Monday's edition of Locked on Tar Heels to hear what the perspective, what the story is, what the breakdown is, uh, whether it's a win or a loss for North Carolina. And the same can be said over on the Locked on Blue Devil side of things. So, man, it's it's just Friday if you're listening. Maybe this is a, a late Saturday listen for some people and the game is just hours away. As we're talking to you on this Friday, I'm just ready for the game to get here tomorrow. I'm ready to rock and roll. Yes, yes. I, I can only imagine how how the feelings will be on Saturday. Everyone is going to be probably very tight, very anticipatory, and I just can't imagine what that's going to be. Can't wait, Isaac. It's going to be a great one. And uh, as I said, this was awesome to get to a Locked On crossover together. The first yes. meeting... You hadn't even debuted Locked on Tar Heels quite yet when you and I spoke. And so the idea that now the Tar Heel community is getting to listen to our conversation is absolutely epic. And we know this will end the basketball season, but it's the best rivalry in college basketball. I'll throw it in there for the best rivalry in college sports. So there's plenty of more meetings between North Carolina and UNC. A football matchup coming up a little bit later this fall with Mike Elko's first season at Durham and both teams going through spring ball. So I'm excited to uh, interact with you again here in the near future on the Locked On Podcast Network, Isaac. Absolutely. Thanks, JJ. Thank you. Thanks so much for checking out this special bonus pod episode, this crossover that we did with Locked On Blue Devils host, JJ Jackson. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you get a better understanding of the Blue Devils and who they are and what they will be trying to do to attack North Carolina while still knowing what's actually going to happen, right? Yeah, absolutely. Again, just a reminder, all the normal Friday show is out. You can check that out. All of it is right here in the show feed, whether you're listening or watching. Either way, you will be able to find both shows today. Thanks so much, as always, for checking this out. It's a great day to be a Tar Heel. Until next time, peace!